Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode number 125 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today Mikey Taylor, pro skateboarder to the founder of Commune Capital. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy this conversation. We're live, we're live in the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today Mike Taylor. What is up, brother? What's up, dude? Thanks for having me. We had a, we were getting a, we had a little conversation just before we started. Uh, Mike's out of LA and, uh, it's been an interesting year for a lot of people. So we're going to talk a tad about that. But how I'm going to start off conversations, I want to actually know, Mike, when you grew up, where'd you grow up? How many siblings you have? And where does your love for skateboarding started before? Then we'll get into the business later on. But where'd you grow up and let's get a little little overview of you as a child. Okay. I grew up right outside of the valley in, in California, a city called Agora. And, uh, like I was a normal kid, dude, no, normal SoCal kid played, uh, baseball, played hockey, rode bikes, hockey in LA. Uh, that's not really regular. That actually <laughs> wasn't the normal. I, I said that. that was maybe a little bit of an outlier, but you're, little- you're, you're at the age when Wayne Gretzky, when you were a kid was Wayne Gretzky yeah. there. Oh yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So it was getting popular then. That's right. And yeah. rollerblades had just hit. So it like, yeah. started with like roller hockey. And then I eventually went to dice hockey, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I just did things because they were fun. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, one of my friends got a skateboard and he was kind of the cool friend I had. So I always tried to be cool like him. Yeah. And so I got a skateboard just trying to fit in. And, you know, prior to skateboarding, everything I did was I, I was really obsessed with it. Right. It was all I could do was all I could think about, but it was short lived. Uh, skateboarding was the first thing where the obsession just never went away. Uh, and then, you know, 27 years later, I looked back and went, wow still obsessed with this thing. What, just, what age did you get your first skateboard? Uh, I was probably 12, 13. Okay. Okay. And it's crazy. Is now, nowadays, it's probably, that's, I was gonna say, that's late. Nowadays, it's probably kids are on four or five years old on skateboards. That's probably right. super late for skateboarding. So where did it, was it, it, was it something where all your buddies did it? Or was it something you just grabbed it, gravitated to and just really took off on your own on it? So, so in the beginning, all my friends did it. That was like the fit in phase, yeah. right? And then I think for them, they had the natural experience that I was having with the other sports. They did it for like a year and then they stopped. And then I was the only one that kept doing it. And then all of a sudden my friend groups kept changing yeah. because I was trying to constantly be around people who were skating. It just didn't ease. It was so skating so different. It was like the first thing I did that was unconventional and the way you did it. And if you did it differently was actually cool. Right. Yeah. We're like, you know, hockey, it's very simple, dude. This is how you skate. The puck needs to go in that, you know, <laughs> hole, and then you score, right? Yeah. Skateboarding, it's, it, there, it, there's like no rules. There was something so like free about it. Yeah. About it. Yeah. Yep. And then I think the other thing is uh, everything else I did, it was always me trying to beat other people. And skateboarding was the first thing I did where the battle was against myself. It, I, I, all I wanted to do was be better than who I was. And I think that, kind of challenge and the fact that skateboarding is so hard, I just never was able to master it. And I was obsessed with mastering it. You know? When, when did you do your first competition? What age? Oh, I did my first competition when I was 19. So that's a, also a good big gap. The first con- the first contest I ever skated was a pro contest. I skipped all the amateur contests. You did, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not a contest. Like, dude, contests were never a thing for me. And I think like, that was one of the reasons why I was attracted to skateboarding. Cause like, dude, kids were doing it in the streets. They were doing it at the high schools. They were doing it. Like yeah. there was no like structure. There was no like arena. It was just in the streets. And like, I love that. And I think once contests started becoming bigger, I, I always kind of was not interested because it felt like it went against what drew me towards it in the first place. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You know? 
So through the process, give me, give me, give me a couple stories of your skateboarding uh, career. Give me some stories, uh, a few interesting stories, just to, just to ramp out the, uh, to the crowd. And then we'll get into uh, you going in your twenties. Oh man. Stories. Uh, <sighs> Gotta be a couple of good stories in there. There's some good ones. So there was, so I was probably, oh gosh, 20 years old. And we used to basically, there was a point in my life when I was like completely nocturnal because we would skate. We had to wait till basically business or schools were out of, yeah, uh, uh, they weren't open. Right. So there was a point where I was waking up at like three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon and being awake until three in the morning, four in the morning. And that was my cycle because at five o'clock, all the businesses shut down and at six or seven, all the janitors left the schools. So we went and started lighting everything up. We had lights, generators, the whole nine. Right. And we became like, you know, we were just like on a mission to get tricks. And so we were in San Bernardino at, uh, I don't even remember the school. It was probably one in the morning and we have the spot lit up. There's probably eight of us. And like, dude, we used to get kicked out by the cops every day. Like us having run in with the police was so normal. This time was different. Guys come in guns blazing, everybody on the ground. Right. And we're like punk kids. We're like, these dudes are so dumb. Right. And all of a sudden they get us all together. They, you know, they run all of our information and, you know, we're like brats to them. Right. Like you get, let us, come on, you guys aren't going to do shit. We're talking shit to them. (laughs) And uh, one of them goes, all right, Michael Taylor. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, come with me. I'm like, okay. I walk with him. He's like, do you have something to tell us? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, it shows that you have a warrant out for your arrest. And I'm like, crap. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Like, did I forget to pay my red what? And he's like, "Uh, for armed robbery, all of a sudden I'm handcuffed, right? And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? And now all my friends are looking at me and I'm like, dude, it's not me. I, I have no armed robbery. And they're like, you robbed a 7-Eleven three months ago. You had like all this crap, right? I'm like, dude, it's not me. And now I'm scared. And I'm like, uh, and my little brother's with me. I'm like, Matt, call mom. I don't know what's going on. Tell her to come help, right? And the cop's like, okay, they, they go to basically arrest me and walk me. And as they're walking me, I'm like, hey, dude, Honestly, it's not me. Like, if you knew where I live, like, I live, like, in the movies, dog, like, suburban, in the suburbs, like, we leave our doors unlocked, like, dude, this isn't me, dog. I'm like, run it one more time. Like, run my, my info one more time. And the cop's like, okay, fine. Runs it one more time, Michael Taylor, and, and you know, the dispatch, where it's like, okay, Michael Taylor, August 29th, 1980, right? And I'm like, okay, shit. And all of my stat, all of my info is correct, right? And then basically at the end, uh, the officer goes, just double checking, is the is Michael Taylor Caucasian? And the girl officer goes, or the, the person on the dispatch goes, No, he's not. And we have the same info. Wow. And, uh, and the cop's like, you know, he's like, okay, let's me go, right? And I'm I'm like, aren't you going to say sorry? Like a punk. Aren't you going to say sorry? He's like, get the hell out of here before I arrest you. You're like, all right, we're gone. And took off. So that was, that was one of those kind of trippy moments. Um, but yeah, dude, run in with the police. That was like all the time. So X games, how many times do you compete in the X games? I skated X games, maybe three times, three years, maybe three years, three years. Is there one highlight in your actual pro career that's just like put a little feather on your cap or something you could you're proud of or something you accomplish or something that that that's just you know what that 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 was the highlight of my career um so there's two kind of big uh goals that a pro skateboarder has yeah the first one is to become pro and yeah. get your own skateboard with your name on it that's like the i did it i'm a pro but the one that not many people get and is kind of like the Holy grail is getting your own shoe. So yeah. your own signature shoe. Yeah. And, uh, basically I, I was, I was writing for this one shoe company. They told me they were never going to give me a shoe and I, I wanted a shoe. So I do a deal with a new shoe company and I'm trying to negotiate in my deal for them to give me a shoe. They won't do, they won't put it into my deal. 
right? And I'm like, what's it going to take for me to get one? And they're like, look, man, you're going to have to create enough demand for us to put your name on a shoe to sell it. I'm like, okay. And they have a video coming up, uh, like a big, you know, uh, it, for us, when a company put out a video, that was like the biggest deal as a pro skateboarder is to have a part in those videos. That was like what our career is based on. Yeah. And so I had two and a half years and I basically set out to get, I wanted the last part. The last part was like the, you know, you closed it down. You had the best part in the video. Uh, I ended up not getting the last part, but I got the first part, which is like the second to best one. Yeah. I ended up getting such a good response in the video that at the world premiere, we're traveling all over the world. We come back and then I get a call from the president. He said, we're giving you a shoe. And that was like one of those moments I called, who's my wife now? I called my girlfriend. I'm getting a shoe. I did it. You know? So I would say that was probably one of the, just because it was such a big goal and not that many people get it. That was a pretty big one for me. How does that work? economically like how much do you, you don't have to give me numbers in detail but how does that work percent wise roughly because i'm sure nowadays has changed quite a bit but how did that work for you percent wise and all that stuff so with every with every uh shoe company they have a different structure with with the shoe company that i rode for is about five percent yeah and uh you know it, it, with my first shoe deal it worked similar to like uh maybe what an artist uh deal looks like, uh, music, uh, where I didn't get an advance, but I wasn't able to see royalties until I sold more than my, uh, income that came in each month. Right. So if they paid me five grand a month, uh, and I got royalties every quarter, I'd have to sell more than 15 grand worth of shoes until I get to participate in the 5% royalty carry. Right. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of how the first shoe structure looked. As I got a bit, little bit older and wiser, I started trying to remove that benchmark and just get paid a salary plus all my royalties. Yeah, uh, that took about five years to get, but I eventually got it. When when did you officially uh, hang up the uh, skateboard? When did you officially retire? What age? Uh, officially, it was thirty four. Thirty four in the skateboarding yeah. world is that is that how, like give me an understanding in the skateboarding world is that already getting up there? Or is that is there that's, a lot of guys still a lot of pros in that age group? So the generation that came before me, kind of the pros who were pros before I got in, uh, they did so much for changing the skate industry that that group was able to be pro way longer. Yeah. It was kind of my generation and my perspective that set the new normal of how long a pro could be pro. And that typically landed somewhere around 30. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I had, I had a 15 year career, which is long. Like my goal was like, if I hit 10 years, that's, that's a, a pretty big league career. Injuries. What was the worst injuries you've had? Uh, let's see. Uh, broke my hand, had a surgery on my hand, uh, tore a ligament, my leg, uh, and where that ligament was connected. Uh, I fractured the bone with it. And it was a partial tear in the ligament. So every time I lifted my leg, the bone would uh, separate. The bone would separate. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That one, that one was, that one sucked. How long did he have to heal that one? So I skated through it for about a year and a half in pain every day. Yeah. Uh, and then I finally got surgery. Uh, it took five months and then all pain, pain was gone. I should have done it a lot earlier. <laughs> and then that was kind of it. Like as far as injuries go, like, uh, I, I kind of made it out pretty uh, unscathed. So you fast forwarding all these years now, we, you, you were married as a pro skater still. Yeah. Yeah. Now fast forwarding all these years and we're, we're how, what, let me start. Let me re- recycle there. So you met your wife, what age? I met her when I was 15. Cause what we, I, we both moved into a new community and we were neighbors. So I met her when I was young. And, and you guys later. And what, what age did you guys get married at? Uh, I was 27. She was 26. Oh, so good age. Good age. So fast forwarding, a lot of guys that are in this industry, and we, and we talked about this prior to we getting on air, you are a part owner of a business that's still in the industry, but a lot of guys still keep in that industry. And you went full cycle into a different industry. Um what was the reasoning for you not to like, really like focus on the industry and really like brand on it? Like what pushed you away into other industries? And, and obviously real estate is, is, a, is a lot bigger of an industry. I understand that. And, and I, I play around quite a bit with that. So we'll talk about that in a sec, but 
what made you not really want to stay in that industry full time? Yeah, there were, two, I think there were two big kind of factors for me. Uh, one, the skateboard industry, which I love and, and it's hard because it's going to sound negative. Yeah. It's so niche and it's so small that I, I didn't feel like I was capable of doing something at the scale I wanted to do it at. Yeah. Uh, was the first part. The second part was I was really scared to stay in something that I was really comfortable in. And I felt like that was going to limit me as well. And like as skaters, we really struggle with identity. You know, we spend our whole life being a pro skateboarder or our whole life being a skater. Then you become a pro skateboarder and it carries this new thing. This is who I am. Right. And when that ends, it's, it emotionally it's a challenge and you feel this like urge to go back into the skate community because that's where you get praise and that's where you get love. Yeah. And that didn't feel, there was a component of that that felt weak. It felt like I was more feeding ego than trying to become the greatest version of myself. And as good as it felt to be praised, I knew that wasn't going to create greatness. And I, I wanted to be better than the person I was the day before. I love that. And it, I mean, you could try, you're talking about skateboarding, but I mean, you could talk to any pro athlete. I mean, the, the, I, that, that sport becoming their identity and breaking through that is a lot of people suffer with that. A lot of people have a hard time with that. Yeah. And right. that goes even, I mean, pro you're dealing with college athletes, division it's one. Anyone, it's anyone that has to reinvent themselves. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. like, I, I was listening to something yesterday and, you know, the guy was talking about things being taken from you, yeah. right? Like, what if, what is the one thing? Like, is there something that if God took it from you tomorrow, would you be okay? Right. And if the answer is no, then that thing had become your idol. Right. And that is very true. I experienced that full hand. It's like the, everything that was driving me was me being a pro skateboarder. Yeah. Right? And that's why once it was stripped, I all of a sudden felt like I was nothing. It was like my whole world, all the lights were turned off. Right. So it was like, do I, I guess it would be comparable to like you being addicted to something. Yeah. Like, is yeah. it better to continue the addiction because you have the short term good feel? Yeah. Or is it better to work through the pain, the, the pain because on the other end, you're actually going to feel more joy, you yeah. know? Yeah, you feel it. You're feeding your adrenaline constantly with that. Yeah. How did you transition into the real estate market? So, uh, I was I was always really scared about what life was going to be like after skateboarding financially. I, the the emotional stuff that we were talking that wasn't even on my radar. Yeah. Like when I I got hit with that, I got sucker punched. Yeah. Had no idea it was coming. <laughs> uh, my fear was always the finance side. Yeah. And, you know two reasons for it. One, when I grew up, I grew up in the era that kind of the message was, if you don't go to college, you are not never going to be successful. And when I told my parents I wasn't going to college and I was going to go skateboard, they reinforced that message. This is a <laughs> bad move, right? <laughs> so I think I always hung on to this idea that if I'm going to be successful, I'm going to have to do it myself. No one's going to give me the shot. No one's going to open the door. This has to be my creation, yeah. right? But to add on to that fear, I felt like my only skill was riding a skateboard. Like, oh, now what? I got to start something. My only skills, I'm screwed. Yeah. Uh, I started learning that as skaters, there's actually a lot of things that we're taught that really pair well in creating business. And so kind of you bring all of those components together. And I was always aggressively pursuing what was next. And I was doing it two ways. One, I was living like I was broke to maximize the amount of money I can invest into assets that were going to pay myself so that if a a sponsor called me and ended my career, I didn't have to rely on the sponsor anymore. I was always trying to pull control away from the income source. I love that. that. Uh, And real estate was the big driver for me on the passive side. Yeah. Uh, When I got my first shoe, which I was telling you about, you start working through the economics of, of, you know, product sales. I started making so much more money when I got my first shoe. Because I went from, you know, making small minimums and having my name on boards, which, you know, when you think of it, if a skateboard shop buys my board, they might buy two of my boards. Yeah. Right. If they buy my shoe, 
They're going to do every size run, maybe double size runs in every color. The amount of units you can sell, it just goes up significantly. Plus, people buy skate shoes that aren't skaters. And all of a sudden, I get my first shoe, which that just reminded me of a story that I should have told you for my skate careers. I'm you'll, unbelievable. You'll, you'll go back. On. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go, go back. back. Yeah. Uh, when I got my first royalty check for my shoe, I had never seen that much money on one check. Do you join me asking what it was? It was like 50,000 bucks. And how old right? are you? I was 23. So I was like, yeah, that's this good. is out of this world, right? Yeah. Um, and, and just to kind of give context, most skateboarders never make over 100 grand, right? So getting a $50,000 check for the quarter, that was like out of yeah. this world. Uh, when that happened, I started really enjoying the process of figuring out how to sell more shoes. And that kind of natural evolution took me towards, I want to start my own company. I want to do this myself, which ended up being in craft beer. The first company I started with two of my friends is in the craft beer industry. Interesting. Yeah. So that was, that's, that a, was that's, a, that's a hard industry. Yeah. We were so young, naive, and we're skaters. Like we feel like we could go through hell to do anything and we're going to, you know, succeed yeah. as long as we just never quit, which we don't. Yeah. So, you know, put all that together, we pulled it. Anyway, I thought that was going to be plan B for me. Yeah. Uh, we ended up selling the company. We didn't think it was going to happen so quick. We sold the company in the first three and a half years. Oh, wow. And yeah. We sold it to Miller Coors actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so when we sold it, we ended up selling it before my career had ended, which was a great blessing. But it was like, wait a minute, this was my plan B. Now, what the hell do I do? And so when my career eventually ended and I'm hit with all this emotional stuff that we were talking about, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? Uh, it took me about a year to figure out what was next. And it all happened from a phone call. Another pro skateboarder, those friends with me called me. And he was like, dude, what is your deal? Do you mind like, me saying the, what was his name? Sean Malto. Yeah. One of my closest friends. Uh, and he basically checked me. He's like, are you good? Like, where the hell are you? Like, I don't see you. You're not like, are, are you okay? And I was basically just like, threw it all out there. No, I'm not. Like, I don't know who the hell I am. Like, yeah. I'm sitting on the couch. I don't know what to do. I'm trying to start these companies to fix this void in myself because I, I, I want people to like praise me again. It was, it was, I just kind of threw it all out there. Right over said, right? yeah. and he goes, no, dude, like, how are you paying for How are you, are you financially? Okay. Like at this <laughs> point I had two kids, I had a house. He's like, are you good? And I was like, oh, like secondary. Yeah. yeah. You know? And he was like, dude, I, I get it. I don't want to discount like how tough that is for you, but oh my gosh. I hope I'm in that position. Are you kidding me? Like you have the ability to figure out what's next. That's insane. Like yeah. we don't get that as skaters. Yeah. And it was that phone call that basically created the first idea of why am I in this position and why are most of my friends not? And as I started working through that idea, it eventually led to the creation of this company now, which was how can I create a company that empowers all of my friends in skateboarding to be in a better position than what we traditionally experience, which is our career ends overnight. We call one of our sponsors we once had and beg for a job, right? And for me and what we didn't cover, I had somebody come into my life when I was 19 because my parents were so scared about me not going to college that they said, you're going to connect with this guy and you better listen to every word he has to say. And his name was Randy and Randy started mentoring me around finance, around money, yeah. helped me create a plan, helped me create disciplines, helped me save to be able to invest because I just wasn't making a lot of money back then. And then when I was investing, uh, one of the big drivers was real estate. And at the time he was running a storage fund. They were converting uh, dead retail into storage. Yeah. So that was my first in into real estate. And so when I originally had the idea, it was, how do I recreate what Randy did in my life for my friends? That's and awesome. the two things that he really blessed me with education, which was empowering me. Yeah. And then he had opportunity for me to place dollars in. And so that was how I started the company. Uh, when I started thinking about what opportunity I wanted for skaters to invest in, I wanted it to be a risk adjusted return. I wanted there to be some component of eliminated risk compared to maybe St. Archer, which was the company we started prior, which had all of the possibility of failing. Yeah. 
I wanted something that they could count on when their career ended. And I wanted it to achieve two things. I wanted to achieve wealth build and I wanted it to achieve cash flow. Because for us as skaters, those are the two levers that yeah. we're always trying to pull, right? How do I grow my wealth? But how do I get my wealth to pay me so that I can live off it so that I could remove control from sponsors, right? But you, so you, you could turn that around to every every entrepreneur it, in general. That's so general and so it's so true, right? So so this that was the formation, which again was like this, yeah. talking about skaters. Uh, when I started talking about the company on social media, I couldn't believe how many other athletes started hitting me up. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, these guys feel this pain also. Yeah. And then it wasn't long after that where I started having more conventional style careers call me and go, dude, I don't play sports, but like what you're talking about of being scared of the unknown and feeling like you can never step off, you know, the treadmill. And the second you do, it's like, I have to do this forever. Like, even yeah. though you're talking about the sponsor having the control, I have the employer that holds the control. Yeah, 100%. I'm trying to achieve the same thing. And then at that point, it was like a lot of uh, sales guys started resonating with us. Then we started having like, dude, lawyers and entrepreneurs and all of these like different careers that I never would have expected would resonate did. And then our smallest base actually became athletes. There are, there are like minority investor base now. So what is your main investment? Is it more commercial? Is it more, is it more vacation? Is it more residential? What do you guys invest all, in? Yeah. So when I started this company, I started it. Uh, the first platform was uh, multifamily. Yeah. And we started going after uh, dead malls. And the reason we did that was my partner, or so I'm skipping ahead, Randy, my mentor. Yeah. In, in the storage portfolio, they created a, a, a platform to buy big box retail, Kmart's, Walmart's, Bed Bath & Beyond's when they go vacant yeah. and repurpose them into storage. And I saw such, uh, I had such a great experience on that side because they had created a niche that was hard to get into. So competition was down and they were buying a true discount and forcing value up to yeah, yeah. call it market, right? So I was like, yeah. dude, I love the repurpose play. Yeah. So we started taking that same model that he was going after in storage and applying it to multifamily. But the 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 opportunity we saw was in these malls going dark. You know, you go all the way back to Amazon and it, it was a slow process, but our consumer behavior started changing over the years, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And so we started recognizing it, started going after those malls, and then COVID hit and it just freaking went bonkers, right? Uh, and then basically a year and a half ago, uh, Randy, see, now I'm skipping around here, ADD's <laughs> hitting. When we started St. Archer, it was me, my friend who was a pro skateboarder and a surfer. Okay. We had no business experience. Yeah. And we had to raise money for the company. We didn't know how to do that. But I had Randy. So we called Randy. Randy is who helped us set up St. Archer, taught us how to basically go out and pitch, helped us with our business plan the whole nine, right? Yeah. Fast forward, when I wanted to start Commune, uh, at this point, I knew how to raise money. I knew how to start a company. I didn't understand how the kind of, how fund management worked. Yeah. Right? He did. I was investing in his storage portfolio. So I had a meeting with him, presented my business plan to him and said, Randy, I need you to show me who I need to bring into this group to build out this vision. What do I need to know? Can you educate me? And that conversation led to ultimately him asking me, dude, either I'm going to go tell you who to hire. Like, why don't we talk about doing this together? I do this. I've known you for 20 years. So basically, long story short, we end up forming the company together. Two years into our business. We're using social media. I have this whole idea that we can create a true brand and community behind our company where all of our competitors, and you know real estate, they yeah. don't do that. No, no. Right? We start seeing such, we start seeing a lot of growth, I, I guess, say it humbly. Uh, he then basically brings up the question to me, what if we merged our companies together? and storage. And then there was a lending portfolio that he was managing as well that I was passively investing in. What if we bring those two platforms into this company? And basically we ended up doing that about a year after that. And so it's been a year now where those are our three portfolios 
and two of them I've been investing in passively my whole skate career. So it was like a very kind of like unbelievable journey in how we got here. So that's a very long way of saying we're in multifamily, we're in storage, and we're in lending. Interesting. Interesting. How many athletes, you said is a small part of it right now. How many athletes are you guys like portfolio? As you said, it, give it a, a rough percent of how many um, percent wise of the business now, so, the athlete wise, because you did just transitions now into like anybody could come in and invest in the, in the brand now, right? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have to apply. Yeah, of course there's a process, but. but- but you don't have to be an athlete. No, out of, I think we're, we're getting pretty close to about 400 investors. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And I would say 25 are athletes. So and there are like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in the last, needless to say, in the last 13, 14 months, a lot more opportunities come arise for you guys. Yeah. What happened to us in the last 14 months and, and for anyone who's not in kind of the real estate industry Typically, what you're always fighting against is when it's easy to find deals, it's hard to raise money. Yeah. And when it's easy to raise money, it's hard to find deals. Yeah. And that's because when everybody has a lot of money, prices are through the roof. And when yeah. prices are through the roof, you can't find good deals. But on the alternative, when everything crashes, everything's on sale, most people hold reserve. their money. Yeah. That's right. Uh, this is a moment that I've never experienced before. We have deal flow and we have capital coming in. And both are moving kind of simultaneously together. Yeah, That won't last, but uh, it's an interesting window right now where we're raising more money than we've ever raised before. And we have more deal flow than we've had before all at the same time. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a magic window. I love it. I love it. I love it. So with, I mean, quick question. And this is just yeah. as an outsider now. And, and I, I have a company called True Blue Homes where we have uh, nine properties of vacation and commercial real estate. And we just do it as passive income. Um, yeah. With the um, commercial, like you're talking about the big Kmart. I would see, I always would assume those would have lease agreements. So you're not it, it just when they close down, you're going directly to them or you're going directly to the owners of the plazas or the to to purchase that that property. It depends. Yeah. So basically, uh, what you're you're right, uh, but when the lease is up and they leave, if that is the case, yeah. Think about how much space they're occupying. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy amount. Right? Yeah. So it's not always easy to get a new tenant to fill the space. Oh no, most of them are sitting empty forever. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, or, or they'll get a big box gym, or somebody will try to jump in for, and they'll be living there for five, five, four, five years, lease free, kind of thing. That's right. That's yeah. right. So uh, it, it, there's kind of different scenarios in which it can happen. But what we look for is uh, this thing being vacant for a long time. So they truly, it becomes a distressed asset. Yeah. Uh, our biggest challenge is always working with the city. It's not, it's not getting the asset. It's allowing zoning. Like, yes. Yeah. Cities don't like storage. No. Yeah. 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 So how do you, but you said with the, uh, with the multi-home, are you, you're not turning any of them into multi-home as well, are you? Just the, so the, so mall, are they, are you breaking them down and turning into more condominiums? And so the, so for the, so two different portfolios, yeah. right? On the storage side, we go over, we go after big, big yeah, box yeah. retail. Yeah. On multifamily, we go after malls. Yeah. And basically what we do is find a dying mall so that we get that discount again. Yeah. We're trying to find an areas that have a shortage of, of living. Yeah. We can get a city who is motivated to help us build these things out. And then we scrape them and then we develop. Yeah, yeah. And so kind of what we're doing is like a true mixed use. Yeah. Uh, kind of the person who lives there has everything they would want right then and there. They don't have to drive anywhere if they don't want to. So like all of the retail truly complements the people living. Yeah. And then you have that experiential component as well. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So we have a big one we're working on right now in Ohio. So you guys are right across the U.S. right now. We're across the U.S. Yeah. How many projects would you have on a, on a regular basis running at one time? Because I don't think point. people realize the logistically the it's manage is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Like I have, I deal with one property and I, and, and just logistically building it is a, is a stress. Never mind right across different States. Right. Yes. Yeah, so there's an answer to it though. Uh, we have, so we have one, two, three, we have about four projects happening on the storage side at the moment. Uh, and then we have, uh, one mall at the same time. And just to kind of give you context, the, 
the mall, we're building about 850 units. So about a million square feet, right? It's a big project. Uh, And then we also have about, oh gosh, 40, about $50 million out in loans right now. So servicing the loans is also a component to kind of the operation. To answer your question, great team. That's it. You, yeah. in, in this sport, I know you, it's a team sport. You have to have people uh, helping you oversee all of these projects or it, you just, you can't do them all. No, no. And, and how we do it, that we're kind of doing it at what is, what is large to other groups is small to others, right? Like there's groups that, that like we are like the little, little fish in, in the pond, you know? For yeah. us, we're like, damn, we're like, we're doing our thing. <laughs> Yeah, but you can look at that. You can look at that towards any industry, right? I mean, yeah. you you're, you have to stay in your lane and grow in your lane and be happy with through your lane. Yeah. Because. But to it, answer your question, like on the storage side, uh, we can take on more storage deals at one time than we can multifamily right now. So when you're running uh, the storage, is it is it actually under an umbrella company? Like, do you have a brand for all the storages? Like, he's here in a, Toronto. There is there's Toronto, Canada. There's certain brands that you see all the storages are under one company or whatever. So what's the name of the company? It's a great question. So our model, when we build them out, we then bring on a uh, third party manager and that third party manager actually is, is the brand in a lot of cases. So like, you know, life or cube yes, smart, yes. Uh, they'll come in to manage our property. So when you go to our property, it's branded cube smart. It's not and branded commune. I love it. That's kind of like the McDonald's uh, mindset, right? Yeah. Owning the property. I love that. I love yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. I, I had no yeah. clue. Yeah, you would think these people, I mean, there's, I mean, I was looking into that on a different scale. Um, a lot of the strip malls, um, especially in, um, in Ontario, a lot of the strip malls have most of the suburbs, the strip malls have a, a walk-in clinic. Yeah. And it's a great way you buy it, turn into a turn into an, an actual medical yeah. building, and then you're just flipping into doctors that you know they're going to pay the rent no matter what, right? That's right. Yeah, I think like right now we are not a management company. Yeah, it's not what we are. Uh, I think you get to a point where it makes sense yeah. to start managing your own properties when you get to like maybe the right amount of doors for it. At that point, maybe we would get there. Like I love the idea of us owning the brand of the managing as well. Yeah, from a marketing standpoint, uh, we just don't have enough units yet. I think for it to make sense. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at you because you probably forgot by now. What was that great story you wanted to talk about? So okay, you remember uh, it. Okay, good, good. Yeah, this is a good, this is a good one. People like this. So I'm 23 at this point. Yeah. Uh, I just bought my first house. I lived at my parents prior to this. And just for context, my parents never even let me stay home alone when they went out of town. I'm 22 years old. I've already been around the world twice. And my mom's still bringing grandma over to watch me yeah. when she's going away. Right. I love it. I love it. Uh, and so I buy this house and like all of a sudden freedom, right? And I'm the first one out on my friends to live on their own. So basically the house very quickly becomes state house. Right? <laughs> that was a party city. Seven of my friends living there. It's a, it's a shit show. <laughs> and at this point, I'm negotiating with my shoe sponsor uh, for a new deal. And it just so happened that they overlooked the contract. The contract ran out and they had just launched my shoe. So they had already committed to a certain amount of shoes that had to go to the market and my contract was up. Right. Oh, wow. Which gave me leverage like no other. And so I'm, I'm sitting here trying to play hard, like guys, it's time for me to make more money. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, it, Tim's my good friend. I was like, dude, you have me by, by the balls. Like this is wrong. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm not going to take advantage of you, but like, we got to figure this out. And we're going back and forth, back and forth. Right. And so I'm getting a new contract showing up at my door every three days. Wow. Right? And it's like the UPS, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and so I get to a point where like the conversation is going nowhere. We're not kind of so, getting to, a, I'm going to ask you one quick question through this whole process. You don't have an agent. No, I manage myself the whole time. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Good for you. Uh, so I'm negotiating with back and forth and we're just not getting anywhere. And yeah. I'm frustrated. And like, I get this basically thing dropped off new contract. I'm like, God, this is just so dumb. I just throw it. Right. Yeah. Fast forward six months later, I signed the deal. Yeah. Everything good, right? I'm having a party at my house and everybody's hanging out. Somebody's like sitting on the couch and somebody just like leans underwear under the couch 
and pulls out this, what I think is a contract, right? Yeah. And he's like, Mikey, what is this? I'm like, oh, dude, just throw that away. That was some old contracts, like, don't even bother. And he's like, oh, let's just check it out. Opens it up, right? Pulls out two checks, oh. right? First shoe check and first clothing check. Because I had my own signature clothing line too, right? Yeah. It was like 50K on shoes and like maybe 15K on clothes, right? He looks and he goes, Mikey, what is this? And I'm like, what is this? Right? I don't know. I open them up and my jaw drops. What the, this, and all of a sudden I'm like, it hits me. I almost threw those things out. It had been six months. I called Gavin, who was the president. Hey dude, can I still cash these? Like, uh, yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. That was a good one. That's crazy. Crazy, 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 crazy. So where do you see your company going over the next, say, what's your forecast over the next, say, five to 10 years? So, uh, and is there other adventures that you want to get into at different fields or anything else that's, yeah, yeah. that's a really good question. So our business goals right now, we yeah. want to, we want to manage a billion dollars of assets in the next five years. That's our goal. Uh, if nothing changes and we do what we're doing right now, we'll get there in about 10, okay. but our goal is to get there in five right? yeah. and just for context on the, on the equity side, we're managing about 120 million of assets. Yeah. So we've got, we've got a 10 X this, yeah. uh, from an impact standpoint, uh, our community, we're just kind of starting to hit this groove where like our community is growing. People are paying attention. Yeah. Uh, I, I want as many people as possible to at least be educated in finance. Uh, it, and I know we're not going to do it ourselves, but I have this goal or this vision where if I'm speaking this, you know, throughout all my platforms and, there's, you know, a handful of people doing it right now. If that inspires the next generation, we might get into this full movement where like, it doesn't even matter if the schools don't teach anymore. Kids will become educated. Yeah. So uh, that I think is just more on like an impact. Like I, people have to figure this out. Uh, what's next? Uh, I, I want to get to a point where we have an app for a company. Uh, I think would be really cool. Uh, I think probably natural evolution, there'll be a point where we have a VC fund. Uh, we kind of expand outside of real estate. Uh, but I don't want to do that until we are uh, capturing all of the opportunity that is in front of us in real estate. So even though I want to do all these things, it's not the right time. There's too much in front of us at the moment. I love that. And I, and I think a lot of people spread themselves too thin with the realization of just what the opportunity is there. And then all of a sudden they don't capture the full. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And that's that's a lot of people. Oh, it's a huge challenge. And a lot of, and a lot of people, and I've, I've been in that boat many times. I mean, a lot of people, you you see an opportunity, you jump on it. And then you, you, you only have 24 hours in a day. You only have the right people around you and you realize very quickly where your energy should be. So I love that. Very, very cool. Um, Fatherhood. What does fatherhood mean to you? You know, when people ask you questions and you just think of like words, <laughs> uh, it's incredibly hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done by far. Uh, Explain that. You don't realize this, how this, this conversation just got deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, kids really bring out your imperfections. Uh, uh, yeah. For me, for example, uh, I always knew I was kind of selfish. I mean, I'm pro athlete. I do things my way, right? I was blown away with how selfish I was. And really realizing that when we had kids of like, wow, this is like hard for me to be selfless. Uh, Had to work on that. Uh, How hypocritical I am. That was a big one. Like learning that kids don't listen to you. They watch you, right? Yeah. And me telling them to do things as they're watching me not live it out in my own life. And then all of a sudden they're doing the things I'm telling them not to. I call it, in, I, like, I call it indirect mentoring. You don't right. realize it. Like, I, I don't know if there's another part of another business I do is um, a, a community called Man's Purpose, which I coach entrepreneurial dads. And mm-hmm. one thing I teach is how indirect mentoring we do every single mm-hmm. day. You don't fucking realize it. You don't realize it. The actions we take speak so loudly and they affect our kids and they engrave in their brain the stuff we do now. That's right. So the big kind of uh, change that happened for me was the realization that, okay, my kids are watching me. 
And what are they watching me for? They're watching me to see what a man is. Yeah. How am I as a husband? Yeah. How am I as a father? And those two components are going to create their view of what a man should look like when they go and get married. 100%. Right? 100%. Uh, when that one hit me, it was like, oh my gosh, I have so much responsibility here. Like, not only do I need to be the example, but like, it's my job to build them up and create leaders to then go out and make an impact, right? And as an entrepreneur, that's actually really hard because you're so obsessed and focused on the business that by the time you get home, you're exhausted, right? And now you're like, oh my gosh, now I have something that's even more important and I need to put even more output over here. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a hard switch, but- uh, I, 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 I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be a little device, Mike. And this is, I actually coaches. I, I, called, I call it the three to seven. Everybody could call it the different time zones. Um, you find and you make your unnegotiables. I call my unnegotiables. So that block time with your kids every day and your family and your wife, I call it around dinner time. So I find, yes. especially your kids are young, yeah. we dinner time for the last, God, I mean, the last month, I, I'm I, life has been crazy with me visiting my dad and helping my mom. But prior to that, I would say a good 11, 11 and a half year period. I don't think I missed dinner at home once because yeah. I found, and this is something me and my wife really put into an understanding where dinner time was an open communication. And we yeah. would have conversations and just relax conversations. My kids are, my daughter's 15. My son's 13. They're teens now. And they're sitting down in dinner times telling us stuff that most kids, teenagers wouldn't tell their parents because they have that safe zone, that comfort. So that's one. Second is, like I said, I block and it's non-negotiable. And then I figure out how I'm going to still run my businesses. I, you have to figure out something to sacrifice. So sacrifices, I'm up at 4.30 every day. Right. I fucking hate right. it. I don't like waking up early. That's I do right. it because I realize by four thirty to nine o'clock, the amount of shit I can get done allows me to be home and be present on that time. When I'm present, that's everything too. You can be home for half an hour, turn off the fucking phone, be present, that's right. That's right. be present. These are all that's things right. that you could block in and be present. Right. So, uh, that's sorry right. for that. Right. that no, it's, it's so valuable. We, yeah. we do a six to eight, no phone. Very cool. Very cool. We do a high, low, hawk, hit, you know, we, yeah, yeah. we're, we're on that, but I, I didn't, I didn't know that going in. That's something I had to learn and, yeah. and learn to trial. Yeah. And then yeah. the waking up early, same thing. I'm not a morning person. I have to force it every single morning. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I yeah. love it. Um, your wife, what does your wife mean to you? And how is she, is she, she have her own career? Is she's working with you? Is she, she supportive? Did. She had her own career. She, so my wife, what I was attracted to her in the very beginning and more so now, uh, she's really smart, really driven. And always went and did her own things. Independent. So like, you know, she went to school for business, wanted to be interior designer, went to fit him for design, started her own interior design business. Uh, and I was like, dude, this is sick. Yeah. Right. Uh, we had our first daughter. She kept growing the business with our first daughter, had our second. And she was at the crossroads of like, this is either my moment to scale or this is my moment where I, I need to pause. Uh she chose to actually pause and basically go full time in raising the kids, yeah. uh, which I'm incredibly thankful for. Yeah. Uh, but she's a, she's a, she's a sharp one. Yeah. She'll be back at it when the time's right. She'll be back at it. I mean, that if yeah. you're just by what you described, she's obviously like my wife, same thing, very independent. I've been self-employed. I've been an entrepreneur for 20, almost 26 years. I'm 44 yeah. and I've never worked for nobody my whole life. And uh, my wife's a very opposite where, where she is very independent, but she needs her. She has a good career. She needs her nine to five. She needs her security. She, we've been married for, like I said, we've been married for almost 18 years and we don't have one bank account together, Mike. Oh, you don't? We don't have one bank account together. She has her bills. I got my bills. We never argue about money. We have this. She's, I'm, I'm the driver, the hustler. Go, 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 go. She's huh? the grounder. I get home. She grounds me. She grounds huh. me. Okay. This, I like that. So it, it, as a nice little that nice little balance for to her, it's, she wants a simple life. She wants, yeah. she, her mindset is if today didn't change, it's been a good day. She just uh, wants a simple life, family time, vacation, build yeah. memories, um, enjoy your family as much as you can. And then I'm the, I'm the, the hustle, hustle, hustle. So she's really focuses on grounding me. And I think yeah. that's, it's, it, it works out, right. It works out. We have that, that great understanding. So I, I appreciate that. Um, with yourself, I always, okay, there's two questions I'm going to ask you now near the end. Superpower. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Fly. Oh, come on. You got to be better than I fly. I don't, I don't know why. I look, man. I, that's <laughs> all I want. So I, I was big on Superman. Like I, I, when I have dreams, you see back I, there? I'm falling. You see there, back there? there you go. 
I'm not, look, it's basic, man. I'm <laughs> going with, I want to fly, man. If something were to happen to you today, in a few words, kind of like a living eulogy, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? Mm, that's a good one. Uh, how I want to be subscribed. No, described, described or remembered. I, I would want to be remembered as, gosh, somebody who gave more than they took. I think to keep it simple, selflessness, you know, like yeah. truly putting people first. Yeah. And I think that's very powerful and something simple, but it's very powerful. If you could live a life like that, you've, you've done good. Yeah. And you'll help yeah. a lot of people along the way. I would be super stoked if that was what everybody said, this is what he gave me. And like, I always felt like he'd never want anything back. That's, that's what I'd be stoked on that. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to leave with our audience today? Oh, you know what? I'm going to leave this one only because it's fresh on my mind. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm real heavy on TikTok now. Right? Okay. Interesting. Okay. Younger platform. Uh, and I'm noticing now the things that like, I know I'm going to put out that are going to do well, but are going to be controversial. It's good. There's going to be kind of a triggering yeah. from it. Uh, and something I'm seeing that like is almost becoming the biggest trigger is when I tell people that it's possible, it's really strange. Seriously. Really strange. Think about that. I know. So, so I talk a lot about, a lot about money, yeah. right? It's possible for you to become financially free. It's possible for you to earn this. It's possible, right? That is becoming a trigger. Wow. And so it's, it's scary. And so I guess what I'm going to leave the audience is that there's anyone in that boat it all starts with yourself, right? Like what we think is possible becomes our reality. Yeah. And if you don't think it's possible, you're right. But if you think it's possible, you're all you're also right. Yeah, it's a manifestation, so, right? It's exactly right. So really be mindful of how you are limiting yourself and how you're speaking to yourself because at the end of the day, we are our biggest hurdle. And anytime you find yourself reinforcing something that's not moving you forward you got to check it immediately and get rid of it uh and that's the biggest one i'm seeing right now which i think is scary like and, and to kind of move it on to the next one like one thing we say as far as like investing the biggest investment or the biggest return you'll always see is investing in yourself right i, I always say that I always it's, say that it's becoming not true yeah. that's the scary thing right it only applies if you're willing to go out and get it Right. If you tell somebody your biggest return is going to be when you invest in yourself and they go out, they make one effort. All of a sudden I'm the victim. This wasn't for They're out to get me. You failed. You won't see any return. But, but what you said there is that victim card. Yes. I think people are rewarded more on social media to become a victim than to become a champ. And right. that I think is one of the negative aspects as much as there's tons of positive aspects. That's a negative aspect of social media because somebody posts, they got a job. You'll get three likes. You post, you lost a job. You have 30 million people commenting and, and comforting you. So people want that and they play that victim card because they want yeah. that, that sympathy back. Right. So I think that's yeah, hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with you. I'm shocked about that. I mean, it's just something where I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in, in you have to, Invest in yourself. I mean, and that is okay. and that is not even business. That's that's physically, mentally, spiritually giving back to yourself. Like Oprah says, filling up your cup, like taking time for yourself, doing stuff for yourself, investing time into yourself. Because if you're not at your top peak, you're not going to be able to serve, be a dad, you're not going to be a husband, you're not going to be a boss, you're not going to be able right. to serve people at the folds if you can't serve yourself. So I, I I love that. That's a great way to end this conversation. Um, how could our audience get hold of you? Uh, I think the easiest place to find me is. Actually, you go on any social platform. Just put in Mikey Taylor. You're going to find me. Yeah. Uh, and then anything you want to find out from there, you'll be able to find. You can find our business from there. I have a number. You can text me. Uh, Mikey Taylor. Love it. I love it. love it. love it. Thank you so much, brother. This has been a great conversation. Oh, thanks for having me. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Mikey Taylor, for taking time of his incredibly busy schedule to be the guest on the Jeff Nozine podcast. Great conversation. If you guys enjoyed it as much as I have, like all weeks, tell your friends, tell your family, help spread the word, and leave a review. Five stars would be absolutely amazing. Me and my staff love spending time reading the reviews. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward.